Welcome to Slavery and Its Legacies, a podcast of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Slavery and Its Legacies interviews visiting scholars, activists, and others about their contributions to the understanding of slavery, past and present, and its ongoing role in the development of the modern world. Hello, this is Tom Thurston, and today I'm talking to Lena Gotteswinter, who is from the University of Regensburg and working on her PhD in American Studies, uh, as she's quick to point out, uh, so she's not mistaken for a historian, although there's like a wide, there's kind of a blur between American Studies and history. Um, and she's working on, uh, for, on her dissertation is on, on thinking about the, the hipster uh, uh, in some ways historically, but uh, but you know, really focusing on the phenomena and also its situation to black culture. Is that, uh, Lena, is that yeah, a good way? Of... That's right. So uh, maybe you could begin by uh, talking a, uh, a little about uh, your, uh, your uh, trajectory, how you kind of got to thinking about, about the hipster and especially the kind of how it, how it um, kind of is situated to blackness. Yeah, um, thank you for pointing out the distinction <laughs> with American studies. So I got to this project um, in my master's degree, basically. So I've always had a great interest in music and popular culture and movies, fashion, all of these things. And in my master's degree, I tried to find a way to fuse my interest with my academic career or my academic goals. And I did a master thesis on contemporary popular music and movies. And while I chose during choosing my topics, I found that they had some some kind of attitude in common. So it was this attitude of being ahead of the curve, of being um, right to right to the point of creating something new or knowing things that other people in popular culture did not know. And that got me to the whole concept of the hipster, which I'm sure everybody has a conception of and everybody right. has an opinion about in general. Mostly it's not a very positive opinion. Um, and I started wondering, I had, I had that attitude in a way too. Uh -huh. So I was wondering why. Why are people annoyed by this character? Why are people um, rejecting this character? And I did some research on it, and I was really surprised back then to see that there was actually there were essays about hipsters already in the 40s and 50s. Right, right. Yeah, so I right. wondered um, how long had that actually been around this whole phenomenon. So how do you trace it? How, where do you trace it back? And, and, and say a little, I know, again, you're not a historian. But, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, yeah. you know, talk about some of the kind of points in kind of, uh, kind of thinking about what it is to be hip. Yeah, there is this very long history of hipness. So it actually goes back to the slave trade and to slaves who were brought to America in the 17th century um, and of course, they they were under pressure, and they there was this white culture that was being imposed upon them. Right. And in an effort to retain their individualism, their culture, also their just their humanity in this very inhumane situation, um, they developed these idiosyncratic lifestyles and dance and music and all of these practices. And eventually, that got imitated by whites. Right. And this is basically the circle that is repeated again and again in hipness. So it's a constant contact between black and white culture and co-option, cultural appropriation, of course. Right. And that is how the whole thing started. But in general, hipness, this is also something that can be traced through every stage of hipness. And there have been a lot of almost waves of very prominent examples. Um, it's always this attitude of being in the know, so right. a priori knowledge. This is something that Anatole Bayard in his 1948 essay already talked about. So um, he called it capping the squares. So knowing uh, something. It's like owning the libs except for, yeah. for uh, hipsters, right? Yeah, okay. so this is, this is the common dichotomy. You have hipsters and then you have squares. And right. nobody wants to be a square, of no, course. No, of course not. And um, so this a priorism means that you have knowledge before anybody else. You anticipate trends before anybody in the mainstream comes to recognize these trends and comes to use these trends. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and yet the uh, the knowledge itself is not knowledge. It's not. It's not created knowledge. It's it's in some ways it's it's knowledge of things that I guess you would say predominantly coming from black culture. Yeah. So it's not something that you are actively, as you said, creating. It's more a way of looking at things, uh-huh. maybe, or also a, um, a framing, a different framing of things. A very <laughs> current example would be um, fanny packs. So a couple of years ago, nobody wanted to have a fanny pack. Yeah, just there for dads. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And now it actually has become a fashion trend. Oh, my so, God. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> 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 but this is basically how it works. You don't have to create anything new. You just take something, put it in a different context, and argue for its hipness in a way, and then it becomes part of mainstream culture. And this is also hipster elements often end up in mainstream, which hipster culture in itself is mainstream right now. I mean, uh, I can understand that now because there's something very postmodern about kind of repurposing things, like taking something, ripping it from its original kind of context and kind of, you know, appropriating it and kind of translates very, you know, kind of... Postmodern, but is that all? Uh, is that equally the case for what I would think of uh, uh, as like the golden age of hipsters, which to me is kind of the fifties and sixties mm. with beatniks and uh, kind of and jazz music and and that. I mean, was that? Do you think that was equally the same there? This kind of uh, like appropriating and then reusing, or is that a mark of like this twenty first century uh, phenomenon? I think this this practice of pastiche of collecting things and putting them together in new forms with a slight difference, that is definitely a very postmodern um, phenomenon. But if you think of the 1950s, the Beat Generation, they had very this great admiration for all of the blues right. artists and all of blues music and culture. And of course, this blues music was a very specific, creative, and also innovative music genre. Right. But the way that hipsters then appropriated in a way, they they made a job out of being a blues fan. Right. They did not actually create something. They did not make their own blues in general. But, for example, if you, if you think of Jack Kerouac and On the Road, the style of his writing was supposed to evoke this kind of blues improvisation. Right. So they are... the. I would argue that the blues culture was very original and was very... Um, yeah, creatively innovative, uh-huh. and that the beat understanding of this culture then was a copy or an imitation. Right, and you uh, mentioned uh, Norman Mailer and uh, yes. the White Negro, uh, uh, his very problematic essay, but that kind of makes is kind of making that argument uh, uh, as well. That that, that yeah, uh, and maybe uh, and and also mentioned uh, which maybe it could go into a little uh, James uh, Baldwin's response to Nor- Norman Mailer. Yeah. So um, in 1957, Norman Mailer wrote this very problematic essay, The White Negro, which is very, very, (laughs) yeah, problematic, but also um, notorious in academia. Yes, of course. So um, he offers a very supremacist position and argues that after World War II, because of the constant threat of the atomic bomb and the conformity that was governing society after that time, that whites had to adapt to or Americans had to adapt to this constant threat, to living with this constant threat of immediate death. Also, the aftermath and the memories, of course, of the Holocaust, the experiences of the Holocaust unsettled um, the psychological setup, basically, of um, Americans. So he argued that whites had to or did use... um, Blacks approach to living with this immediacy of death. So they imitated their, um, they imitated blacks as a coping mechanism because blacks, of course, had been living with a constant threat to their life for in, right, for right. decades, for centuries, and um, he he then said that whites or white hipsters specifically had to use this kind of approach to life that blacks had in order to cope with these mechanisms. Yeah. That sounds, I mean, which kind of reoccurs this kind of trope. I I mean, John Lennon kind of talks about the black experience uh, in this way. Uh, 
which I will not repeat, uh, as does Patti Smith at a certain point in her career. I mean, this does seem to be that that situating oneself as kind of like like the black experience uh, as a way yes. of kind of uh, defending yourself from uh, uh, the mainstream culture or whatever. Yes, which of course is a very problematic stance to take. Exactly. And that is also what James Baldwin reacted to. So James Baldwin actually was friends with Norman Mailer, but he wrote a scolding response to Mailer's essay called The Black Boy Looks at the White Boy. And he, for one, he made very clear that nobody that actually was part of blues culture or part of hipster culture would call Norman Mailer hip. (laughs) <laughs> which I'm sure he was pretty upset about because so, he identified as a hipster yeah. and he was yeah. very... That's why it's dangerous to identify as a hipster because you're always in danger of being you called should, out. You should be aware of what you're doing. You should really like be aware of what you're doing with the self-positioning. Um, and Baldwin basically called Mailer out on this this ignorance about the actual experience of being a black person right. in America and right. also the appropriative mechanisms that are behind what Mailer is arguing in his essay. And basically, eventually, Baldwin just says he cannot make any sense of this essay at all. He cannot believe that this essay has been written by the same men who wrote these novels, right. which do have a literary value. But... Um, Yeah, so Baldwin was very upset about Mailer taking this position and using this, using black culture to position himself in that sphere. Uh, Now, um, this is all prologue. Uh, Really, your focus, it seems, is is really on contemporary hipness. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and again, we uh, heard uh, heard from you. yesterday uh, uh, talking about it, and, and many of the people in the room were uh, very interested at the wide variety of, of, of hipsters, but also in a way in which, uh, contrary to our idea of um, the beatnik or the hipster uh, of the 50s and early 60s, uh, the kind of association with blackness doesn't s- seem as, as obvious. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you kind of uh, uh, spin that out? Yeah, so contemporary hypnosis is a very fascinating phenomenon because for in the early 2000s, especially in New York and in, in other metropoles around America, there have been a lot of hipsters and hipster culture, very prominent hipster culture, if you think of Williamsburg in New York, for example. Um, and if you had references, so if these hipsters used references to the past of to hipsters from the past, it usually were was the beat generation. Right. So nobody seemed really aware of the black history of this whole concept. So at the most, they may have heard of the nineteen thirties, forties blues culture. Right. But aesthetically, especially, the beat generation were the role models. And in recent years, there's been an explosion of hipster subgenres. So there uh-huh. are eco hipsters now. There are the lumber sexual with this, yes, we're which familiar is with those. yeah, that one is probably yeah. the most prominent one right uh-huh. now. So with the flannel shirt and tattoos and yeah. the full beard. So there are a great variety of hipsters now, right? Because the internet has been a great. Um, perpetrator of hypnosis in that way because you have a lot of access to different um, cultures, different historic elements of pop culture. Right. You can become an expert. At, yes. At, you can at, curate your identity right. according to what your preferences are. That, of course, makes it also more difficult to be individual, mm-hmm. which is why hipsters might be reimagining themselves every two years, it feels now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really gotten to a to a very wide spectrum of hipness, and because hipsters have also seeped into the mainstream, it it is really hard work to be a hipster right now. Well, my heart goes out to them. <laughs> um, uh, I uh, you know an, a, another thing that that again maybe you can enlighten me, but uh, I also tend to associate kind of that that earlier generation of hipsters as as like having a at least some kind of philosophical underpinning that might include Camus or uh, Sartre, uh, uh, that, you know, seeing themselves, mm. and again, kind of in this problematic way of, 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 of being apart from and oppressed by mainstream culture, but, you know, use, but at least having a kind of 
philo- philosophical foundation mm. behind that. Is there any of that like in this, or is it a kind of consumer kind of? Yeah. So there, there are some values that hipsters in the past have definitely promoted. So again, prime example, Beat Generation. Um, it was a deliberate self-positioning against the mainstream, against conformity. Right. Um, the men of the Beat Generation were refusing to take the stereotypical gender role of the breadwinner. Um, they were promoting a, a great degree of hedonism, of liberalism, um, which is kind of a double standard for the Beat Generation. Totally. If you think about the women of the Beat Generation, for example. Right, right. So Many of Kerouac's wives have... Have have written things about yeah about the supporting the uh, the hipster yeah and like women like Diane Prima she was one of the beat writers and was constantly contested by them and saying well you have to take care of the kids you can't really write then she said well I can <laughs> <laughs> and she did so um, yeah there are there are these values of of hedonism and liberalism and also to a certain degree a nihilism. Mm-hmm. Um, but contemporary hipsters have been accused over the over the years of being basically an aesthetic impulse rather than having a certain stance. So they they may showcase a rebellious side and trying to go against mainstream culture. But another cliche of contemporary hipsters is that they are at liberal arts colleges or all right. middle class college educated people. Yes. So hipness, in a way, now seems to be understood as a testing ground for, in a way, um, moving outside of mainstream culture without running the risk of actually alienating something or giving right. up your chances and your opportunities that you have. Yes, of course. So, 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 so hopefully, art school will both kind of validate your hipness, but also will somewhere provide a career or something. Yeah. That you're not entirely. Uh, um, uh, setting yourself adrift and going to, exactly. to squat in in uh, an empty tenement. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the thing. Uh, um, now, within this wide variety of of um, of, of uh, hipsterdom, uh, I mean, there's also uh, 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 you know a very uh, interesting uh, group called that you kind of call or that are called the the black hipster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, from your description of it, uh, it really seems to be pushing... I mean, some things are similar uh, mm-hmm. as far as kind of distinguishing oneself from the mainstream, but really pushing back at uh, some of the assumptions of, of kind of white hipster communities. Can you go yeah. into that? Yeah, so the black hipster is a very controversial phenomenon. So right. um, there's also been the term blipster thrown around in forums and um, discussions about hipness. And black hipness has basically two reactions right now. So on the one side, you have people who reject this idea and especially the term blipster, yeah. arguing that it's appropriative and that um, it, for example, also it gives the illusion that there is a monopoly of whites to certain parts of popular culture or to a certain aesthetic. Right. And most people argue that this, the way people consume culture is not dependent on ethnicity. Okay. Um, yeah. On the other hand, there are self-identified black hipsters uh-huh. who argue that it's a mechanism of empowerment. Um, because of the cliche that especially contemporary hipsters are white, male, middle class, um, black hipsters moving into this fear are basically arguing they are refuting stereotypes. So they are challenging this norm of white male hipsters and are claiming something that right. is not the only exclusive right to whites. And in this way, they are also pointing out the, the black history of this whole concept. Mm-hmm. And um, bringing up the issue of this, these racial dynamics that have been governing hipness for centuries now. Uh, give it, uh, t- talk about uh, someone who, um, who kind of, in, in your thinking, epitomizes that kind of take, that kind of stance that, that you're talking yeah. about. So one of the um, prime examples that, is, that are often mentioned in these articles is Solange. So mm-hmm. Solange Knowles and her, especially her two lat- latest albums. Absolutely. 
Yeah, which are amazing. Yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> they, are, they are amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, and she actually, um, is, like, if you think of her first album, you can see this very political stance right. in every single song, in every right. single interlude. Yeah. Um, and her aesthetic, I was lucky enough to to go to a concert in Hamburg last year um, in the Alphenharmonie, which is this huge, beautiful opera house. Right. And her performance was was outstanding. It was amazing. And the way she presented herself in this very unique aesthetic. Um, so she had a very... Absolutely. Yes. So she has her own very unique aesthetic. Um, definitely moving into this avant-garde um, vision. and. But with these little bringing along things. And, yeah. You know, like, you know, like the kind of... Texanness of of her uh, in in this avant garde kind of uh, yeah uh, moment she has it's amazing yeah. and yeah. she she has she performed this this idea of what people are arguing black hipness is about of okay. asserting what black culture has how it has actually created hipness in the first place how it. Um, distinguishes between hipsters, like contemporary hipsters who are just uh -huh. allegedly superficial and artificial, right. and actually mm -hmm. enhancing this or giving this the actual subversive stance that it happened, it just had in its origins and in, in the way it came about in this whole racial tension. Right. Yeah. So Solange is an example. Another example would be Childish Gambino. Right. With, of course, this video to This is America, right. which is very um, charged with with political statements. And, yeah, so he's another, right. another example. Right. Uh, you, uh, you sat us down and, and, and showed the whole video, yeah. which I'm sure some of the people had, hadn't seen before. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's certainly, if you haven't seen it, it's certainly worth, uh, worth viewing. Uh, so, yeah, so go on. Yeah, so um, Donald Glover, who is the Child alter ego yeah. of Childish Gambino, um, he has been very active in recent years as a producer, as an actor, um, artist, music artist. And in this video, he, uh, if you think of the title, This is America, it could be a patriotic video. Sure. Um, it could be a, um, a, a song about the great things of American culture, but actually it's a biting critique of the American history um, in, in violence against black bodies. Yeah, which there's a long tradition in yes. black culture and literary culture in Amer in poetry and, and other... Uh, yes, He's talking just exactly. about that, so he's certainly participating in... So he, he seems... He stands in this tradition yeah. of using performance and using um, creation to voice resistance and critique against this kind of violence. And it's very graphic. So you have Absolutely. people being shot. Um, you have he because in the video, he's constantly dancing in front of the camera and in the background. You have this turmoil with riots and um, suicides even and apocalyptic riders. Right. But throughout the whole video, he doesn't stop dancing making a comment on how the entertainment industry is used to actually distract the audience from what is going on in the country, what are the issues. And it ends with a very, um, very crucial scene in which he is running in a dark room towards the camera, being followed by a mob, which, of course, evokes images of fugitive slaves, right. of lynching mobs. And this is how he uses his, his status as... As hipster and especially also black performer to illustrate how the entertainment industry has helped make people forget the history and yeah and, and remind them what the entertainment industry could actually be doing right and you know it's uh, now that you mention it it's like throughout most of the uh, the video He's kind of affectless. He, yeah. uh, you know, and that kind of removal from what is going on ar around that, even that he's participating in, um, uh, that is kind of like a hipness, a, a hip trope of coolness. Uh, but at the very end, it's like there's, he's right in the, he's right in the middle. He is the object yeah. of violence, and and you just can see it in his expression. 
so which yeah. I think is a very interesting way to kind of bring it around. Yeah, exactly. So during the video, he is um, part of this entertainment. He is smiling. He is um, pretending to be happy. But then in the scenes where he actually uses a gun and shoots people, you can see his face fall. You can see something mm -hmm. is wrong behind this facade, right. behind uh -huh. this mask. And that's a very poignant way to put it, yeah. to frame it. And the, the ironic detachment that usually is part of hipster culture. So hipsters are in general considered to be ironic, not um, let it show that being a hipster actually yeah. is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so keep a, keep a sense of authenticity. This is definitely a very, it's a very dark component of this video. It's sarcastic to the, to the brim. It's... Mm -hmm. It's um, making a very, very poignant statement by the way he's framing this whole narrative. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, in fact, uh, critiquing not just America, but I think the, uh, kind, the kind of yeah. cool and detached uh, uh, attitude, especially when this is the stuff of entertainment and popular culture uh, yeah. that, you know, we just let wash over ourselves. Yeah, it's become a spectacle of, of um, marginalization and of victimization. So people are be people are used to this now to a certain degree. So they are used to um, seeing certain images, seeing certain certain news also, but choosing the entertainment industry over reality. Right. Yeah, so this is, I think, one of the points of the, this video that has a, a big impact on the audience of actually pointing out, okay, yes, there is the ent entertainment industry, but what is underneath or how are the the um, cultural currents around it that actually foster videos like that? Right, right. Uh, are there, um, so uh, what would, uh, what would um, uh, Dan Glover, how would he kind of characterize himself and his kind of cultural stance? Does he kind of identify with, you know, I, yeah. So he he doesn't really identify as a hipster as such, uh -huh. or at least I have not read anything on it. However, he does present himself in a certain manner. So he calls himself a blurred, so a black nerd. Uh -huh. And he also described how he was the only person at a Sophia Stevens concert. <laughs> and he has, especially if you th also think of his other work he has done with um, community and his his career at um, 30 Rock, if I remember correctly. Uh -huh. So there is a certain sphere in which he has already been acting in and yeah. associated yeah. with. Um, he has been very, it has been shifting in, in recent years a little, but uh -huh. um, he definitely has this association with hipness and with uh, being part of this culture. Right, right. Yeah. And it does seem that he's had enough exposure to kind of pull things out without yes. necessarily having to claim to be of that yeah, culture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, just out of curiosity, who are, uh, who are some other uh, um, uh, musicians uh, that that you're kind of looking at in this, in, in thinking about uh, uh, kind of black hipness. Yeah, so I um, I also looked at Janelle Monae, yeah. who is um, very, very prominent right now and very successful. Right. And I especially was looking at how she uses black history or, or the, the music industry of the past um, how she pays tribute to that in her own work. So she has a very eclectic style of music mm -hmm. with a lot of jazz, blues, funk elements in it. And she is also sartorially paying tribute right. to the past. So um, with her iconic suit as her brand in a yeah. way, she is evoking the image of Gladys Bentley. So a Harlem Renaissance singer, um, a very successful queer performer who was pushing boundaries in the 1930s by dressing as a man, right. by um, being openly gay. And this is, for me, there is a clear connection between those two women hmm. and the subversiveness that they, they are trying to, or that they did and do convey in their music. And so Janelle Monet is one example. Um, I have looked into a few other few other um, musicians that I'm still working on 
figuring out if they are hipster culture or if they're not. So um, the band TV on the radio is yeah, an, right, yeah, right. indie rock band. Um, I'm not really sure if they will fit the description yet, but um, they are definitely calling out the whiteness of indie culture right now. So yeah. especially of indie rock culture that has been a very white phenomenon for right. years. Right. Right. And TV and the radio are definitely um, pointing that out and refuting that yeah. with their amazing music. So, um, I have to ask, uh, 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 in, um, in Germany, there is, is there, tell me, there's a hipster culture there, I assume. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> Are they, and authenticity is so valued there, are they kind of borrowing from the subcultures that are in the States or are they mm. creating their own or how would you kind of characterize them? Yeah, so there is a pretty um, vibrant hipster culture in Germany, especially in Berlin. Uh -huh. um, you could maybe even argue it makes sense yeah, with absolutely. being a hub also where musicians kept coming, very hip musicians right. and kept staying there. Yeah. Um, for a hundred years. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so the culture, the hipster culture in Germany is actually pretty similar to um, hipster culture in the States, which uh -huh. makes sense because we draw a lot of, <laughs> a lot from the United States it's pop our culture. Main import. Yeah, so it's it's very popular in Germany too. Um, there are some European influences, um, mm. for example, Scandinavian culture has had its sure. um, influence, especially on architecture and aesthetics and fashion also in Germany. Um, there's also the, right now there's some, in some ways, a Asian influence traceable. So mm -hmm. especially with the rise of eco hipsters, for example, so these environmentally um, aware hipsters how, what is the connection with uh, an Asian influence uh, amongst the eco-hipster? It's eco um, uh, like Buddhism and spiritualism connecting oh, to, yeah, it's, again, uh, it's okay. not really, that's the point about hipsters. They're not really doing research. They just take right. what thing fits, yeah. With yeah, their, they, yeah. fits with their agenda. Uh, uh, again, 50s hipsters glommed on to a lot of Buddhism. And yeah, that as well. so something that like that. that. And a lot, yeah. of, lot of yoga. Yeah. But I know a lot of your work, uh, in addition to music, is on fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and and could you say a little more about that? Like what defines yeah. kind of uh, fashion kind of in, in this community? Yeah. So fashion is, together with music, they are the major characteristics of how you can identify a hipster and also how you can identify as a hipster. Right. Um, fashion specifically has had a long history of... Um, promoting subversive and critical statements. So if you think of the suit suits, um, right. especially, that was definitely part of hipster culture and part of this excess that was also connected with hipster culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that for hipsters in recent years, fashion has been either to offend, as in intended to offend or shock. <laughs> in, the, in the early 2000s, there was... A, a craze for men wearing very, very tight pants, which at the time was not yet mainstream, mm -hmm. and aviator glasses and what they called um, like pornography mustaches and something like mm -hmm. that. So deliberately trying to um, make people do a double take and when they see uh -huh. you. Um, in recent years, it's gotten a lot more into the organic way of right. dressing so again the lumber sexual and being being more conservative in a way and this is a, a trend that has been part of hipster culture especially in recent years there's a great deal of nostalgia in the whole concept of hipness so there's always been this nostalgia for um for the past and for revoking or evoking the past and what you are doing right and the problem with that is um, there's actually a great book by Simon Reynolds called Retromania where he describes how especially pop culture and pop music has been taking things from the past and recycling it. But the problem is the things that hipsters recycle now are coming closer and closer to a time now. 
So if you look at uh, contemporary hipsters, they will be yeah. wearing um, 90s Yeah, the 90s fashion. are now yes. in, in, in style. Where, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the past is catching up with... Uh, the past is catching up with hipsters, yeah. and the question remains, what happens when it does? So what are they going to recycle? This is a problem of late capitalism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, uh, that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah, the, the nostalgia can, can also be a very, like, nostalgia for images of the past or of your childhood, there was also a trend of wearing Little League t-shirts mm. or wearing your school sweater or something at in your late 20s. But um, that's the harm, like the, the harmless part of right. this nostalgia. But there's also a very, very harmful part of this craze for nostalgia, which can end in hipster racism. So yeah. Actually, um, that has been coming up a lot in media lately. If you think of Lena Dunham, she's mm -hmm. been accused of that. And hipster racism basically signifies um, performing racism, but then arguing, well, just kidding. It's, right. it's, it's right. part, right. I'm being a hipster, yeah. I'm, I'm ironic. If that I don't shocked you, then you... Yes, you know. exactly. So there there are different different forms of this hipster racism, either just this... I'm just kidding, and mm -hmm. I can say that. And then there's the, another part where people argue, yeah, I can say that because I have a black friend. Right. And that, f to them, apparently is enough to actually perform racism. Yeah. But the fact is, if you perform racism for yourself, ironic or not, the fact is still the same. You are still exploiting power inequalities. You are still exploiting... Um, these these hierarchies and it's it's a supremacist move so no matter if you are pretending to be ironic or not the effect is the same uh, right and in, in fact it uh, you know it, it seems like the alt-right itself has been kind of looking at those yeah. uh, movements and 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 doing the same that I you know is that you're violating my free speech uh, mm. uh, by uh, telling me I can't say this or that or or just kind of um, you know, we're a new generation of right wingers, and we're yeah. but we have cool haircuts, and we uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a an article in Germany about a nipster, a Nazi hipster. Oh boy! Yes, so people were going to Nazi rallies with um, with bags saying, "I have a yogurt in my bag. Please don't push me." Trying <laughs> to be, yeah, trying to be cute and ironic and hip. But this these, doesn't work well. On no, it doesn't work well. And it's also this hipster racism. It's just for me, I think it's very, very dangerous because it desensitizes people to distinguish what is actually hateful speech and what is actually racism and what is just playing or just being humorous. And I very much hope that um, that this will First of all, go away. Readjust. <laughs> yes, that it will readjust, and the people are aware of the, the effects that this still has. Right. So, do you see a future with? I mean, you know, uh, well, before I say, do you see a future? Uh, do you see an unbroken past in kind of thinking about hipness? Because it, um, I mean, in other words, it seems to the casual observer that the '80s may have been a low point for mm. like. Kipness or the '90s or some, you know, uh, or is there this kind of uh, strand? And is is uh, what do you think uh, the future holds? Yeah, that's a very interesting um, question. So, the way that I have researched about hipness, and there's one book that covers the history of hipness uh -huh. pretty well. Um, to me, it is usually waves. So you have waves where hipness is specifically emerging very prominently. And then you have waves like the 80s where it's it doesn't seem as prominent and it doesn't seem as relevant. And your status will rather fall than rise if you mm -hmm. engage in this kind of behavior. Um, and what is interesting is that in a lot of when I when I talk to people at conferences or when I talk to um, colleagues, there are questions of when does it raise so does it does it does it rise in certain times of social upheaval right, or of, right, exactly. of anxiety so we are now um, there have been articles calling this century the age of anxiety yeah so are these mechanisms that foster hipness as Mailer would argue being in the situation where you're not sure what is going to happen what is going to affect you and then you use hipster behavior maybe as a kind of escapism, as um, 
finding a way to cope with these things. So right now it looks like as if hipness would, it's so much in the mainstream now that people are gradually adopting it and even like being called hipsters now or right. calling themselves hipsters, which in the past that was not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, whole neighborhoods. Yeah, nobody would <laughs> nobody would want to be called hipsters, and now it's gradually being adopted as a compliment. Hmm. So, which kind of indicates how it has become part of mainstream culture. Right. Yes. So, I think it might um, might be waning a little right now, but I don't think it will go away. I just think it's it's um, gonna it's a shape shifter. Yeah. It's always changing its makeup. It's always changing its its structures. Um, and it may appear under a different name. Right. But I'm, I don't think that this, this attitude, this habitus is going away. Okay. I have one, one more question. So another response to, uh, to like, social pressures, uh, uh, aside from the kind of being detached and cool, uh, is to be angry and engaged. And I think of the punk... Uh, yeah. movement and how do I mean do they how do they live I mean how do they live together or are they mm. completely uh, do you see any kind of convergence between between what seems like a very hot you know, so like the mods versus the rockers or mm. something that it seems like a like like uh, a whole different kind of attitude yeah uh, and certainly a different fashion sense but nonetheless an attitude in a fashion sense that mm. belongs to it yeah, so um, this is going towards the question of are hipsters a subculture in the way that punks are a subculture? Yeah. And there have been discussions about whether or not hipsters are actually a subculture or a counterculture um, being mostly occupied with fashion and with aesthetics and punk culture actually also having a political agenda and having a political right. ideology behind this. So hipsters right now are taking some parts of punk culture and, again, putting them in this pastiche practice in their own identity, um, specifically fashion items and um, parts or also music. They might listen to punk music, mm. but the actual political stance seems to be missing for hipsters right now. So it's... It's a mainstream subculture. Mark Greif called it that. It's a mainstream subculture, hmm. which in itself is, of course, an oxymoron. But um, I think there there is a distinct or a, there are similarities in that it's a self positioning outside of the mainstream culture. Also, if you think of age, um, hipsters are usually young. Right. That is that is a, a common perception of them. So there are some similarities, but I think punk had much more impact on on social structures and on on political discussion than hipsters do with the exception you might say though of the black hipsters with the hipster. exception of black hipsters right, yeah right they they seem to be introducing this critical edge again to the whole concept so they are they are in a way refuting this um, the stereotype of hipsters being a political and just um, into aesthetics, and they are using this platform to actually make statements and to actually introduce this critical edge again in the concept. Well, I mean, that, you know, as you can, I hope you can tell, I find this really endlessly fascinating, and uh, I'm so, um, it's been s such a pleasure talking to you, and I'm so grateful that you've introduced uh, the term lumber sexual into my vocabulary. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I wondered if uh, you could recommend uh, people who are uh, just as interested uh, mm -hmm. a few books that they might be interested in, in, in looking at. Yeah, um, so there is a history on hipness. It's called, it's by John Leyland called Hip the History, which it kind <laughs> of is a little normative title. So it, it, it is. But a in an ironically misleading. normative way. Of course, in an ironically normative way. <laughs> um, so this is a good starting point because um, so far, books on hipster culture, for a large part, have been ironic and derisive. So there's the hipster handbook. Right, right. These, yeah. yeah, by Robert Lanham that was notorious. Uh -huh. um, and there's also, there was a symposium on hipster culture in New York in 2010. Oh my goodness. Yes, <laughs> which was called What Was the Hipsters? And there is a... Past, um, past yeah, tense? Yeah, past tense. They, hmm. are, they have been just debating the, the death of the hipster for years. Hmm. But it seems to be very resilient. 
Yeah. Um, so this is a very good collection about hipster culture from a different, from a variety of standpoints. And um, it also harks back to Anatole Briard's essay, which is really, really good. Um, yeah, those are the most prominent ones right now for black culture. There are, of course, a variety of books on, on black culture. And um, I just bought a book about um, by Jane Vogel, I think, Stolen Time. Hmm. Um, I have not read it yet, but it seems very, um, very important for my topic because it, it talks about black fat culture and uh, the Calypso craze. Uh -huh. So this might might be a good starting point to evaluate contemporary black hipness in the context, is it a fad or is it actually, um, it is, in my opinion, in this long tradition of black resistance and performances. Well, I'm really uh, interested in continuing to follow your work. And uh, for those uh, who are interested on the website, there'll be, uh, there'll be a list of the uh, books that Lena's mentioned. And again, it's been so great having you Thank here you. in New Thank Haven. Thank you for, for having me. Slavery and its Legacies is brought to you by the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, a part of the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. Additional support is provided by the Rabina Foundation, and production support is provided by the Yale Broadcast Center. For more information about the Gilder Lehrman Center, its activities, and this podcast, visit glc.yale.edu.